I'm inspired by complexity, um, and what I mean by that is the interconnectedness of everything. So it could be anything from the um, level of atoms through to something you physically observe. So I often um, research out at sea in, um, around the Arctic um, area of uh, Norway, and this series in particular was um, inspired by my trips there. So on a physical level, I was looking at how the elements interact with each other, how the land, the sea, and the sky all um, sort of exchanging and merging. So I want to look at the ebb and flow of um, the tides and what you can see and what you can't see. So I generally cast with um, optical glass and there's um, a few suppliers of optical glass around the world, but it's, it, it's um, glass that's used in industry, so for instance the lenses of telescopes. For me, what's important about it is the clarity, because I'm looking to use the, the um, transparent volume of glass as a metaphor for space. So um, for me, having that absolute purity in the cast is very important. So very often what I would do is I would start with them um, drawing and I would draw from observation but I would also draw from memory. So it might be something that I hear in the news or something that um, you know inspires this um, thought process, lateral thinking for me to work with. And then when I've um, got those drawings I tend to put them aside and then I will actually start modeling in three dimensions. And I'd like that to be done from memory rather than from actual drawings so that I can actually um, put those ideas into the making. So I very often I model in um, wax, polystyrene and, and clay and I will get the, the, the basic form and carve into the object and then I will make a mould around that model, take the model out of the mould and then the glass is cast into the mould. So, uh, what's very different from blowing glass is that the mould goes into the kiln cold and the glass is suspended above, above the mould. When the kiln door is shut, the temperature is then taken up to about, for these pieces, about 880 degrees and the glass melts into the mould. Once it comes out of the mould, the glass is sort of covered in a skin so you can't see anything, you can just see the light that's held within. And through um, hours, days, weeks of grinding and polishing, the actual body of the glass is revealed. And, and for me, I've always chosen to work with glass because of that added dimension of light within the body of glass. But I also use um, hand silvering on the body of the glass, and um, so you get this mirrored effect. And for me, again, it adds yet another dimension. And that's what's important for me because it allows people and the environment to actually interact with the artwork because it sort of draws the environment in and draws any available light into the piece. And one of the final processes for me is painting. So I use the outside of the glass as a canvas and um, use very often this um, polychromatic um, painted surfaces and I use paints mixed with uh, metallic grounds to create a sort of textured body and I, I like those, my painted surfaces to be associative so people can make connections with various colours and textures and um, it's very much a part I want people to lose themselves and sort of take their mind on a journey themselves to make new discoveries. Biggest inspiration for me is, is landscapes and also places, more specifically places that have got connection with water and how I shape by water or where water is kind of integral to that environment. Um, so these pieces here are inspired by a trip to New Mexico desert. Um, so it's got the copper colours of the New Mexico desert and um, the erosion of the sort of water rushing through canyons and carving out areas within the surface of the rock faces. 
There's a variety of places, but the glass itself is mainly from um, Portland in Oregon, so it's bullseye glass, um, which make a really specific casting glass. Um, and you can have absolute confidence that it's going to do what you want it to do. It's a really well made glass. Um, other materials like plasters and ice and things, um, a variety of places, mainly based in the UK, as the suppliers. Um, what's really nice is I use my, where I get my ice from is uh, a place in um, Wimbledon that's an ice sculptor that allow me to go and take stuff from out of their freezers and, and um, work with that. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of local to me because I'm up near just south of London, so it's a nice, bit, yeah, nice quick, quick jaunt over there. Yeah, my process is um, I start with a block of ice and then I get salt and put salt onto the ice and the salt will eat down into um, the ice and create these cavities and textures and shapes and then I'll take a direct plaster cast off of that so the plaster will set and the ice will melt out and you're left with a void to cast the glass into. Um, so once you've done that in the kiln you've got a glass representation of the melting ice. Um, it doesn't come out all nice and shiny, so it comes out all matte and, and unfinished. So after that, I then carve and shape and polish to the final, um, final piece. Um, so I'm going to be talking um, on behalf of Richard Jackson, as he can't be here today. Um, I'm Sally Forbes, and I'm one of the other artists in the exhibition. And Richard and myself are married, and actually share a studio. We've actually worked together since um, 2000 in our studio, so we know each other's work and processes very well. So um, Richard and I, some of our starting points are fairly similar in that his work always comes from um, observations and questions that are raised from observations and things that he sees. Um, a lot of his research and his work is actually done when he's travelling and um, references in his work very much point to how humans uh, interact with their environment and each other in the world around them. So the, this piece here of Richard's, All Things Being Equal, is actually about the fact that as human beings we are all very equal but there are also subtle differences and those differences will be set up. So the form is actually an equilateral triangle and within each section of glass he's created these internal uh, veils that are called in technical terms in the glass which are all very subtly different and the blocks are all the same size but they're all divided up by this very soft sort of carving that gives it its um, form. So, the glass that Richard has used with these two pieces is actually optical glass. Again, it's, um, we both use the same sort of glass and it's used for industry, but it gives that optical clarity. And it's actually, if you're a glass maker, it's actually beautiful to, to work with, but it's also very hard, but it does give the, um, the clarity and effect that um, Richard's looking for. And what I particularly love about Richard's work is that he's very good at the detail. So if you look at it, it will be very precise in how it's joined together, but he's very good at creating these sort of soft, subtle um, curves and edges. And in returning cycle here, again, this piece was actually cast in one piece, and then he very much sculpts the glass and uses the diamond saw. So the diamond saw is multifaceted in its use, in that it's using it to sculpt the glass in the same way that you would sculpt the stone, but also then to use it for the surface marking, um, like for instance where you see everything, um, the, the detail all around the edge here, that would be done with a, a saw and also an engraver. I've worked with forms I find in nature for a long time. But 
I'm also interested in, in other objects that I find, and particularly things that um, are kind of everyday objects that we don't necessarily notice very much. So this piece is um, based on casts of books that I got from second bookshops in Strand. And um, you don't tend to look at a book as a form, it's more like what, it, you know, what title is, what it's about. But, so when you stack them up, they make it really interesting shapes. And um, so I've, I've cast that and then use that as a starting point for developing a, a sculpture. I mean, I use a lot of different materials, so um, most, most of them I get in this country, but the, the glass, this, this glass actually was made in, uh, by Pocahontan Special Class in North Wales, which would be the, the raw material. Um, now that's closed down and it's moved to China, so it, it, some of it comes from China. Um, this is also Pilkington glass, the, ori the original glass. I don't make the glass myself, I, I buy glass and then cut it up and, and you know, do things to it and melt it. So that's, I, I don't know where it was made actually, probably in St Helens. Um, and then the other materials uh, really come from all over the place. Uh, I, I'm able to get most of them in this country, but where they're originally made come from. I mean, it is a casting process, so generally the idea with casting is that you, you don't work directly in the material that you want to end up with to start with. You, you work in something like wax, which is much more easier to work, basically. So, so this piece originally um, started as a wax impression of this form, and there is actually a, a mould outside that shows sort of how I got to that. So, casting the books in plaster and then a silicon rubber mould and then a wax and pressure and then you can start to create the form that you want to end up with and once that's finished you make a mould of that, melt the wax out and then you can put the glass into it and put the whole thing in the kiln and melt, melt the glass um, and that part of the process for something like this it'll probably be about three weeks in the kiln mostly cooling, it's a very long and careful cooling process and at the end of that, the mould is broken away, so you destroy the, the mould to get the glass out. Um, and then there's a long process of grinding and polishing to get the finished result. reproduction and decay. Um, these two pieces, although they don't look as if they might be from the natural world, they're to do with the growth of gems and rocks and how stone has been formed um, and taking inspiration from that. The glass itself is this, the pink piece is from the company that makes the glasses and based in New Zealand but they've got a UK distributor. This is a lead crystal, so it's really soft in terms of glass, very heavy. These are both actually, and it's a company called Gaffer. And then the coloured discs in the top, this is an American company that sells glass called Bullseye. Um, both are quite readily available, just expensive, but um, easily enough to get hold of. So I create an outer form, which is this smooth profile, and an inner form, which are these sort of oval shapes, um, and make a mould for each. So for these oval shapes, I've actually used polystyrene Easter eggs, and I form them over something, take a master mould, with the idea being that once I've done all my internal and external moulds, I have a wax model with exactly replicates what this looks like, but it's in wax. I then invest that inside a plaster cast model, steam away the wax, which is why it's called lost wax. The wax disappears and leaves this shape as a negative void, which then goes into the kiln with chunks of glass above the opening. The glass becomes molten and flows in and takes up all this shape. Then it's extensively ground and polished. This is made as a completely separate piece um, whereby I'm stacking 
one millimeter, tiny, tiny, they're called stringers, tiny little rods of glass into a mold. And so they stay where I put them. There's, there's no sort of movement of the glass. So Richard Jackson and myself, Sally Forbes, we um, work in collaboration. We also make our own solo work, but sharing a studio, knowing each other's processes, and um, sort of sharing our um, approaches to our work every day we decided to start collaborating in about 2008. So what's been very interesting about this collaborative um, venture of ours is that the work has a third distinct voice. So when we start off with an idea, we will literally both work on it at every stage. So through from the initial talking through of the idea to actually um, the drawings, the modeling, the grinding, the polishing, the, the carving, the mirroring, we will both be involved in the process all the way along. And this in itself um, brings us sort of a very different synergy. So you've got two people's individual um, approaches to an idea and coming together in the collaboration to say something that we wouldn't have said if we were approaching it on our own. We sort of found the whole process very organic. We found that it's been very enjoyable and um, in some ways quite liberating to have someone else involved and also sort of to question how we're approaching making our work. But I think that you can see very much our own um, input and sort of how the forms are very different to our own individual work within these pieces. So we have contained perspective here which is a very uh, geometric uh, piece in contrast to forms of movements on the wall which is perhaps a slightly more organic piece but together they um, sort of very much have their own individual voice. Goes into the kiln, 
it's fired to between 800 to 900 degrees. And you tr I try and work it out so that it leaves some tiny bubbles because I'm quite interested in having this surface and also internal section where it brings out the qualities of the glass. So I don't want it to look like plastic, I want it to look like glass, I want it to reflect, absorb light as you walk around and change. And that's very much working with light and glass. Mm -hmm.